Good morning, everyone. I want to start this morning by acknowledging that we lost another Vermonter to COVID-19 this week. I send my sympathy and condolences to their family and friends. Every death is a sad loss for Vermont, though we're incredibly fortunate to have gone six weeks without a COVID-related death, something no other state can say. It is, however, a sobering reminder that this virus is still with us and that we must all continue to do our part to keep our friends, family, and neighbors safe and healthy. We've seen the heavy toll it's taken around the country and the world. It's thanks to the sacrifices and commitment of Vermonters that we continue to see good results here in Vermont. Mr. Pichek, who will present our latest data and modeling this morning, but our positive trends continue. And even with the outbreaks and surges many other states have experienced the last several weeks and growing concerns in our neighboring states, we still have the lowest positivity rate in the country, as well as the lowest number of cases. As you may have noticed, it's been a while since our last turn of the spigot as my team and I have been carefully watching trends across the country and the potential impact it could have on us here in Vermont. And while I'm still concerned with what we're seeing nationally, our own numbers show we can take another step forward and we'll increase the capacity limit on retail businesses from 25 to 50 percent beginning tomorrow, August 1st. This step will come on the same day that our statewide mask mandate goes into, ef into effect, which will help support our retailers and their hardworking employees, many of whom have been working on the front lines since the pandemic started. To further support the mask mandate, our emergency management team will begin distributing free masks to towns, community partners, and local emergency response entities with a goal of distributing over 200,000 free masks. While we still have much more work to do to open our economy, I believe the cautious approach we are taking is the right one. And as we talked about on Tuesday, it's critical we keep our positivity rates low in our communities so we keep our schools safe as they reopen next month and work to increase the amount of in-person instruction that we know is best for our kids. The fact is, we'll continue to fight back against this virus until a vaccine has been developed and distributed, which is in all reality several months away. So it's up to us to protect the gains we've made and take steps forward when it makes sense to do so. If we all do our part to suppress this virus, we can get our kids back to school and keep our businesses open. And when you think about it, it's really pretty basic. And it only takes just a few simple steps to make a difference. Keep at least six feet apart when possible. Wear a mask in public places. Wash your hands a lot. And stay home when sick. Taking per personal responsibility is the best way to keep this in check and win the war against this invisible enemy. I continue to be incredibly grateful to Vermonters for all you've done and continue to do in this fight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek to present our latest data. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we will begin today with a look uh, at updated national data. Uh, and then some new modeling that accounts for mask usage, uh, then turning to our regional uh, and Vermont data, and closing, uh, as we always do, with an update uh, on our travel map. Uh, as a reminder for those watching at home, today's presentation uh, is available on our department's website, dfr.vermont.gov, uh, where you can find all of our past presentations and information on all of our modeling partners as well. As the governor alluded to, I want to begin today by marking a grim milestone also for our country. This week, the United States passed the threshold of 150,000 lives lost to the coronavirus, 
tragically including another Vermont life. Seeing the number on paper certainly does not do justice to the pain and suffering that so many families have had to endure in every part of our nation. And while our state has certainly been spared the worst, Vermonters too have lost family members, loved ones, friends, and neighbors. We should keep them in our thoughts and prayers and let this serve as a reminder, again as the governor stated, to take care of each other by following public health guidance. Across the country, deaths from the coronavirus are on the rise. Yesterday marked the third consecutive day and the seventh day in the last 10 where we reported more than 1,000 deaths across the country. After a long period of declining mortality, new case surges in the South and the West have filled their hospitals and most unfortunately are now leading to increases in deaths. In the hardest hit states like Florida and California, Deaths have spiked this week to record levels and indications are that this trend will continue uh, across the West and the South for the near future. The national data does, however, have a few glimmers of hope. The CDC weekly national syndromic surveillance report indicates fewer people are presenting with COVID-like illness at emergency and urgent care facilities across the country. Further on the national level, daily COVID case growth is also slowing. When we drill down into the various census regions, we see that the slowdown in cases is tied back to a reduction in cases in the South and the West where cases had been increasing the most rapidly, uh, while we also see, unfortunately, that those numbers are continuing to increase closer to home in the Midwest and slightly here in the Northeast as well. Turning our attention to the Northeast, again, we continue to see new case growth creep up in certain areas of our region. For example, this past week, Rhode Island and New Hampshire reported their highest daily case count since early June. Massachusetts saw similar case growth this week that they have not seen since the middle part of June. And even Quebec, where the virus has been in retreat for a very long time, it has seen a new uptick in new cases. Overall, the Northeast again saw an increase in new cases compared to the week before, However, that growth has slowed a bit, down to just 2.5%. And when compared to the regional testing data, we can also see that any increase in new cases is outpacing any new increases in testing compared to the week before. Again, although the case growth is slight compared to other parts of the country, we have seen four weeks of case growth in the Northeast, with new cases about 25% higher this week than they were at the end of June. This regional data is certainly something we're going to have to keep a close eye on uh, for the weeks to come. Turning to a few of the models that we work with, uh, as we presented last week, the IHME model uh, indicated that certain parts of the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast, uh, as depicted on the left side of the map, are likely to see case increases over the next few months. However, as we alluded to last week, the model also demonstrates, and as we've depicted on the right side of the chart, if each of these states achieved universal mask wearing, defined as 95% of people wearing masks when appropriate, we would expect to see new cases decline everywhere throughout the region over the next three months in every single state. Even states that are expected to see rapid growth over the next three months would see decline uh, if they achieved universal mask wearing. Again, this highlights the importance of masks, particularly on the eve of Vermont's mask mandate becoming effective. Under all of the models that we have consulted with, Vermont continues to have a favorable forecast. And as the Oliver Wyman model shows on the slide, we can expect to see very low levels of case growth in the weeks ahead, which is certainly very good news for Vermont. Looking at our four uh, restart metrics and Vermont data in particular, uh, again, we saw that new case growth decline this week with only 32 cases reported. This is our lowest weekly total since mid-June. Uh, and compares to 52 cases that were reported from the week before. Again, again, as the governor mentioned, uh, Vermont currently has the lowest positivity rate in the country, uh, the lowest number of cases reported in the country, and the second lowest growth rate on a per capita basis. Syndromic surveillance, again, continues to indicate that very few people are visiting uh, Vermont hospitals and urgent cares to report COVID-like illness. This metric continues to be well below our 4% guardrail, and again, is particularly good news when considering that this is an early warning flag. 
Vermont's three and seven day viral growth rates again uh, declined slightly this week, about a quarter and a third of 1% respectively, which is extremely low level case growth. Regarding our positivity rate, the seven day rolling average again trended down this week to just 0.45%. Again, as we alluded to, the lowest positivity rate in the country uh, and also well below our 5% guardrail. Our fourth metric is hospital and critical care bed availability. Our ICU availability continues to trend around that 30% buffer, but as we've alluded to in the past, it is not a concern at this time, considering that our other metrics are trending so favorably, uh, and the fact that we only have one person in a Vermont ICU being treated for COVID uh, and two individuals currently hospitalized, and we certainly wish them a full and speedy recovery. Turning now to our uh, update on our regional travel map, uh, we again see a reduction in the overall number of individuals who are eligible to enter Vermont for leisure travel without a quarantine, standing today at approximately 4.8 million individuals, down 2.3 million from last week, and down 14.2 million uh, from late June. Looking more closely at the counties that changed this week, we see again that relatively few counties from across our region saw improvement moving to green status, uh, while many more counties have worsened, including counties in the Northeast. We also notice that summertime vacation destinations along the East Coast, such as the Jersey Shore, the Hamptons, the coastline in Connecticut and Rhode Island, Cape Cod, and even parts of the coast of Maine have seen their counties worsen as their numbers rise this past week, with local officials in many cases tying those increases back to visitors and social gatherings that are occurring. Again, looking back historically at the number of individual, individuals eligible to enter Vermont for leisure travel without a quarantine, we can see these numbers continue to trend down, reflecting an increase in cases that we are seeing in the mid-Atlantic and the Northeast over the past few weeks and is something like we've alluded to, we will have to keep a close eye on uh, in the weeks ahead. At this time, I would like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Mike. As Governor Scott noted, yesterday we reported the 57th death associated with COVID-19 our first Vermont death in 43 days. Each death is a cause for sadness and I express my deep condolences to the loved ones, friends and family for their loss. To protect their privacy, we will not be giving any further information about the person or circumstances of their passing, other than to note that this person was again an older Vermonter. The health department has reached out to everyone associated who may have been exposed to the virus to give guidance for their health and safety. As Commissioner Pichak just detailed, we continue to maintain an overall low rate of new positive cases. The Health Department continues to follow the small number of very limited outbreaks, working with anyone who may be affected. In a new development, six individuals have tested positive for COVID-19 upon returning to Vermont from the Tallahatchie County Correctional Facility in Tutwiler, Mississippi. These six individuals arrived at Marble Valley Regional Correctional Facility in Rutland by van transport on Tuesday, July 28th. Following the Department of Corrections protocol, all were immediately placed in medical quarantine and tested for coronavirus. The inmates are currently in medical isolation and contact tracing is underway. A Vermonter who remains incarcerated in Mississippi tested positive for coronavirus earlier this week. This person was housed in the same unit as three of those who returned this week. The department has instructed officials at Tallahatchie County Correctional to test those Vermonters who are still incarcerated in the facility. Our strong and strict protocols to keep the virus out of our prisons helped ensure that no other people in state custody at Marble Valley and no additional staff were in contact with these individuals. To speak again about the progress Vermont has made against the virus, it can't be said enough that the gains we have achieved have only been possible 
because of the cooperation and sacrifices Vermonters have made to protect themselves and others from coronavirus. And while we are hopeful that together our efforts will keep us from experiencing more illness and deaths in the future, we must recognize that our standing is fragile. The virus is new to the human race, and while we have learned a great deal about how it spreads, we don't yet know everything. Work on a vaccine is proceeding, and many are hopeful about the progress that has been made. But at the same time, we must be prepared for the fact that the virus is not going away anytime soon. Indeed, the return of college students is on the immediate horizon, vacation travel continues, and opportunities for Vermonters to find themselves in closer quarters than recommended occur with increasing frequency, making the timing of the mask mandate of real relevance today. I ask everyone in Vermont to again join me in honoring this latest loss in our community by recommitting to doing everything we can to keep each other safe and prevent further spread of the virus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, before I open it up to, to questions, I want to let Vermonters know about a new financial assistance program we launched this week. The Department of Public Service has $2 million in funds to help Vermonters extend telecommunications lines to their homes for internet access. Commissioner Tierney is on the line for questions uh, or, and you can visit publicservice.vermont.gov for more information. With that, we'll open it up to questions. We'll uh, start in the room with Calvin. All right, uh, thank you, Governor. So, um, a quick clarification for the mask mandate that goes in tomorrow. So it says that um, it's, masks are mandated in public places, indoors and outdoors, when you can't socially distance. I'm wondering, what is a public space? Uh, any, well, from my standpoint, I don't know if there's a technical version of this, but anytime uh, you're in a place where there's other, uh, other people uh, that can uh, publicly go um, to those, those spaces. So um, it would be almost any, any get together, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, so maybe you can, I don't know if you can get more specific with an example. Yeah, so I guess, you know, it's not just like post offices and like the state house or the pavilion building, but also private businesses per se. That's right. In public, in, in public uh, yeah, public entities where uh, the public is invited in, in some capacity. Uh, so uh, anytime there's any get together, um, whether it's indoors, we have a limit of 75 uh, indoor um, gatherings and 150 uh, members outside, any of those gatherings would be public and uh, masks would be required. And what if a business owner um, refuses to um, require people and says, okay, I'm not going to turn away people because they're not wearing masks? Yes, yeah. that's their prerogative. Um, we want to leave it up to the businesses, uh, certainly, again, uh, guidance and education is our first preference. Uh, we are not enforcing this uh, at this point in time, uh, but, uh, but again, we'll continue to watch and, and make sure that we're doing everything we can uh, to provide uh, for the needs of Vermonters. Um, this program that, we, uh, that I announced in my remarks, uh, 200,000 uh, free cloth masks uh, will be available uh, to Vermonters, uh, donated by many different entities. Uh, that should help. I mean, that's a third of our population. So um, we want to make sure that we provide everything needed uh, to keep others safe. And, and again, if we, if we continue down this road uh, and we all continue to take care of ourselves and take care of others, uh, we'll get through this a lot quicker. And then just one last question, uh, shifting to the broad end issue that we're kind of touching upon. I know we spent uh, tens of millions of dollars on broadband from the CARES Act. I'm wondering if you have any updates to sort of where we are in breaking ground or installing this broadband, seeing as how we 
for the CARES Act dollars to actually yeah. cover it. Has to, data has to flow by the end of the year. Yeah, I don't have uh, that information at this point in time, um, but we'd be, um, uh, Commissioner Tierney is on the line. She might be able to provide an update, but, but again, this is going to take a little time uh, to, to put this into to action. And with uh, what I just announced, with the uh, $2 million in funds to help Vermonters extend uh, their lines uh, so that they can obtain internet access when, when it's available near them, uh, that'll be helpful as well. But I still believe wholeheartedly uh, this is going to take, that won't be near enough. Uh, and everything we did with the CARES dollars and everything we're doing here uh, won't be enough uh, for our needs. And, uh, and I, I still believe that this needs to be a national issue. Uh, Congress should take action um, and, and, should, and should confront this uh, the way we did with electrification, the REA Act, you know, the REA Elect uh, Rural Electrification Act. It should be a broadband uh, act of some sort uh, to provide for access throughout our country because we're not the only state uh, that, uh, that needs help. Uh, many others do as well. So this should be a, a national effort. Uh, Commissioner Tierney, anything you can offer? Oh, Governor, I thought you covered the uh, the issue very succinctly and accurately. I'm happy to follow up offline with greater detail, but fundamentally, this is a question about uh, funding, and for the dollars that we have set aside under the CARES Act uh, to deal immediately with the crisis, uh, those dollars are in the process of being deployed this program that you've announced today is just one of uh, several that have launched in recent days. Uh, this is the one that most directly affects consumers who are looking to get a line extension that will help them access the internet during the uh, COVID-19 crisis. But the overall uh, picture of Vermont's connectivity uh, will still have significant uh, challenges that we are continuing to address precisely the way you suggested which is through advocacy at the federal level uh, to secure additional funding down the road in order to uh, more comprehensively address uh, the continuing connectivity challenges in the state. Uh, this is the work that we began with the Emergency Broadband Action Plan uh, earlier this spring, and uh, that progress um, on refining that plan continues. Uh, at this time, as many on the line probably know, uh, discussions in Washington, D.C. around the COVID-19 relief funding are complex and somewhat freighted with things that are beyond the control of uh, Vermont and the other 49 states. So it may take some time for clarity to emerge as to whether there will in due course be additional funding available uh, in recovering from COVID-19. But if and when such funding is on the horizon or if and when there is an infusion of money through the REA style programs that the governor is referring to, referring to uh, the state of Vermont will be ready to act. Thank you. Stuart? Thanks. Uh, looking at the travel map um, and seeing the red creep uh, as we, not on our immediate border, but uh, there's a lot of concern about the return of college students. We draw so many kids from Metro Boston and Connecticut and New Jersey and Metro New York, and all of those areas are now in red. And I'm wondering, um, how can you assure that they won't do what young people have done in so many other parts of this country, get together, no masks, schmooze, and no problem? Yeah, you know, we're taking a number of steps. I know the colleges are as well uh, in trying to uh, anticipate that uh, and how uh, this could could uh, affect us on, uh, in a negative way. So um, I would say, uh, you know, having the quarantine period for those who are, are coming into the state, uh, from those who are in the in the red or are out of the green uh, from from the area, is going to be important. Uh, and I know that the colleges, in speaking with them, uh, understand that as well. So. As well, I think uh, we have to continue to watch the map, uh, and that's why you know, it's important to do this modeling every single week to see uh, just what we saw today. And that's why I decided to move forward with the mask mandate, because of what I was seeing trending uh, towards the Northeast. But it could, uh, just as quickly as it's coming this way, it could turn around and go the other way uh, when the summer season, uh, I know a lot of activities and some of the uh, tourists type areas around water and so forth. 
have maybe um, have have possibly uh, uh, been uh, part of why uh, we're seeing uh, this increased number of positive rates uh, in these communities. So, uh, in the next two or three weeks, uh, with with the steps we're taking, with the steps uh, other states are, are taking, we could go the other way uh, quickly if we all do the right thing. So uh, by uh, September, uh, this could be a whole different picture and it would be, uh, again, uh, far safer uh, for those uh, folks to come here. But once they're here, we wanna keep them here uh, as well. I think that's part of our, our challenge is to make sure, you know, if we could if we could surround the state, uh, and we would be okay uh, because we have a low number of, of positive COVID uh, uh, people in uh, in our state, as opposed to the rest of the country. And in contrast, to the rest of the country. So, if we could keep them here, uh, we'd be a lot better off. And I know that's the uh, the mission of many of the colleges and universities as well to keep them here on campus as much as possible. One uh, question about the death. Um, was this a person who was hospitalized? Uh, was this a surprise? Um, I don't know, Dr. Levine, how much information you can get yeah. give on that. I don't have all the details on the case. Will there be more um, inmates returning to Vermont and Mississippi? Um, again, we will do all we can uh, in order to um, bring as many people back as possible. Um, but there are capacity issues here in Vermont as well. I, I may ask uh, Secretary Smith to elaborate on this. But, uh, but again, you know, we've, we've reduced our numbers here in Vermont. We've reduced the number of, of uh, offenders in, uh, in Mississippi as well. And that's what we'd like to continue to do uh, is bring people back when, when possible. But, uh, but we can't bring them all back at this point in time. Secretary Smith. Thank you, Governor. As, uh, as the Governor said, uh, as you know, we've reduced uh, our prison population significantly during uh, this uh, crisis. I think the numbers were, uh, before the crisis, about 1,600 um, uh, uh, inmates in our correctional facilities. We got down to our lowest, around 1,300. However, we always said we were going to be extremely careful of uh, the type of inmate that we would release, and we have been. Uh, right now, the extra space that we have in our, uh, in our facilities and the staff that we have is being utilized for quarantine purposes in case we have an outbreak in one of our uh, facilities and or we have an incident like we had the other, the, the other night when we're returning inmates needed to be quarantined. We have people coming in and out of our facility, and as I've said at this podium before, the fact is that our greatest vulnerability are when people are coming in and out of our facility. That's our greatest vulnerability. So having those quarantine facilities um, uh, available and staffed is particularly important at this particular time and prevents us from um, freeing up more space uh, to bring up uh, other uh, prisoners from Mississippi. With that said, in our FY21 budget, we are committed to reducing the population in our out-of-state facility. I think uh, from approximately 221, I think today, down to about 180 in our FY21 budget. So um, I think everybody wants to reduce that population. It's just as this uh, crisis continues, uh, having doing it in a safe way is important. Okay, we'll go to the phones now. Katie Jickling, PT Taker. Good morning. Um, based on, if my math and the numbers presented by Commissioner Pichak are correct, um, a math menu will reduce cases in Vermont by about two a week. And it seems like uh, the, the majority, you know, the, the, the reasons you pointed to were college kids returning and week papers visiting. Um, to what degree do you see a mandate as sort of protecting people in Vermont from people coming in from outside? Well, again, I think uh, you know, compliance is the answer, however we get there. 
uh, is important. Um, we were on a, a pretty good track uh, before I issued the mass uh, requirement, the mass mandate, uh, but in anticipation of overseeing uh, throughout the region uh, with, the, with the colleges being coming back in uh, with our fall foliage and so forth, I uh, thought it necessary uh, to have some sort of consistency with some of the other, other states around uh, the, uh, the region as well. So um, I don't know um, whether we can put a figure on this, but, but again, it was uh, taking a proactive approach to make sure that we continue uh, to enjoy the numbers that we've seen for quite some time. I mean, we've been a leader in, in many different ways uh, in our positivity rate, uh, number of cases and so forth, and uh, we just want to continue uh, to be able to keep Vermonters safe. Mm -hmm. Governor, you said uh, again and again at press conferences that a mandate won't necessarily increase compliance. It actually might make people more resistant and that there's no way to enforce it. And then you decided to impose a mandate. How did your thinking change on those topics? Well, I think I explained it fairly extensively in the last uh, press conference, but happy to continue. I, I mean, I, I just look at the, the numbers, the data, and when I saw what was happening in the Sun Belt, for instance, uh, the number of cases, the increase we saw in California and Texas and, and uh, Florida, and uh, what, what some in Arkansas and Alabama and so forth were experiencing, um, and they uh, imposed a mass mandate, some of them, some states did, at that point in time but it was after it started affecting them in a negative way. I didn't want to be in that position. I still believe uh, that guidance and education and, and, uh, and advocating for people to do the right thing is a, is a good approach. But time wasn't on our side, especially when I started seeing the numbers that Commissioner Pichek was bringing to us. That's why the modeling is so important to us. Just, you know, really looking at the data and, and if it tells us something, then we should react to it. I didn't want to be uh, imposing something after the fact. I think you know what we've done is tried to be proactive, being one step ahead, all along the way. We're learning something more about this virus every single day, and uh, masks seem to make a difference. So, again, I just uh, thought it was the right point in time to do this, and um, and I still uh, believe it was the right thing to do. Uh, however. Uh, compliance, uh, getting to compliance, and and not, you know, advocating for people to do the right thing with our education approach, which is really hitting the ground running. I think that's going to be an equally important uh, to the mandate, continuing the education approach. Mm -hmm. And lastly, what do you think are the political implications of a mask mandate for you? In what way, Katie? Um, you, there's, you've faced um, some pressure from uh, other gubernatorial candidates, and there's a primary coming up in a matter of weeks. And I'm wondering how, if at all, uh, politics was a consideration, or how you expect it might change things uh, for you in the primary. Yeah, I, I don't think. Uh, it, you know, politics didn't enter into the equation from my standpoint. Again, I've done everything uh, over the last few months based on the science, the data, the health experts, uh, advisement, and just again looking at the numbers and doing what I think is right uh, for our state. Um, but if you want to look at it through a political lens, uh, it probably isn't wasn't the best move on my part uh, to impose a, a mass mandate in Vermont. Uh, in uh, two or three weeks before primary. But, but that wasn't a consideration for me. Okay, Katie, we need to move on. Thank you, Governor. Chris Roy. Yes, good morning. Uh, could you explain about how the community, the entities are to distribute the mask? Are you giving them direction? Or is it at their discretion how they're gonna give the mask to the recipients? Yeah, there's actually a, a protocol for this and a, a plan in place. The uh, SEOC, uh, the State Emergency Operations Center, is taking this on. Um, but uh, Secretary Smith uh, has exactly how that's done, if I can allow him to elaborate. 
Chris, thank you uh, for the question. It, it's called Operation Cloth Face Covering for Everyone. Um, when we do the SEOC, we have to have these fancy names uh, that we we uh, have in this operations. We're going to ask each town, the uh, emergency management department, the fire chief, the e EMS, uh, via form, if they would like their allotment of 25% of their population in cloth uh, face uh, coverings. So it's going to be distributed uh, through uh, sort of the emergency ma management apparatus um, from each town. Also, the National Guard will be distributing um, these masks at the food sites, the food distribution sites that we have. VDH will be doing it at the pop-ups. And I also want to say there's going to be uh, pamphlets that talk about when to wear a mask, when not to wear a mask, why it's important to wear a mask, why it should be important to you to wear a mask. Um, we're also going to be distributing masks to the uh, community action programs around and the agencies around the state uh, as we move uh, as we move forward, and also through VDH through vulnerable uh, populations. So, like the governor said, um, you know, 200 and, uh, over 200,000 masks will be distributed. Uh, through these various entities and uh, 165,000 uh, to your local fire department, EMS, or emergency management department. And what about some of these communities up here in the Northeast Kingdom? We have some towns who don't have a fire department. They rely on neighboring communities like Coventry depends mostly on Newport. Um, so would it be Newport that would distribute the mass to Coventry or whatever? Yeah, uh, department that covers that town? Yes, I, I believe that would be uh, the way that we would do it. But in case, I mean, if somebody uh, isn't getting distributed mass at the local level, please call us uh, and call, call the uh, emergency management department here in our division here in uh, at the state level, and we'll make sure masks get out to each town. Okay, thank you. Lisa Rapke, EAP. Yes, thanks. I wanted to ask about those um, returning inmates who were who tested positive. Uh, so the state has asked for the Mississippi prison to test the remaining Vermonters who are being housed there. Do you know that they actually will get tested? I, yes, I, I believe that they are being tested. Um, again, Secretary Smith, do you want to? Is there anything more to be said on that? Ted? We have, I believe, we are sending supplies uh, to them uh, they're, to have they're, them tested. They're being tested today. Uh, yes, last starting last night and today. It will be finished today. It will be sent to the state lab in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And thanks. So, Lisa, I don't know if you heard that or not, but uh, they're being tested today, tonight. Uh, should get all the results back. Uh, Mississippi has agreed um, graciously to. Uh, to administer all the tests and uh, and give us the results probably tomorrow. Okay, thanks. And then um, on the school reopening order um, for the for the September eighth date, does that affect private and independent schools too? It it will affect all schools. Yes. Okay. And then, um, as you know, there's a lot of concern among teachers and superintendents. Um, there's some concern of, about uh, whether they have enough staff because some teachers may be older or have had health issues or may have spouses who have health issues. I'm wondering, is that something um, the education agency is concerned about, staffing levels in school when they reopen? I think we're all concerned about that, first of all, for the well-being of those uh, the members of the staff, the teachers and so forth, and their families. Uh, we want to make sure that we're protecting everyone. Um, but, but as well, we're, we're not sure of the magnitude of this uh, at this point in time, but it's something we'll be have to consider o over the next uh, uh, couple of weeks. I may ask um, Secretary French if he's on the line who might be able to comment on that as well. Yes, thank you, Governor. Yeah, I think it speaks to, you know, firstly, how the conditions do vary in each district. When state conditions, I do mean sort of the staffing to the essential element uh, for operating schools, obviously. 
Um, it's one of the considerations, actually, that led us to conclude uh, hybrid models is going to be necessary, at least to put on table, to give districts some flexibility, uh, not only in addressing the instructional needs of students, but also dealing with the very practical issues of staff availability. Okay, so so if you did see a, a reduction in staff, you would the hybrid model would be how you would deal with it. Well, it provides districts with an option. There might be staff, for example, that uh, would have difficulty teaching in person, but they might be available to uh, teach online in a remote oh, environment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Ethan. Uh, maybe for Mike Smith, uh, Chris Roy sort of stole my question, but maybe a clarification. So the the emergency uh, rescue squads, fire departments, are they going to be actively passing these masks out, or is it sort of like they may have stopped by the fire station kind of thing versus actually going out into the community? Uh, high-profile public places like convenience stores where we see a large number of people walking in without them without masks uh, and everything like that I mean is this going to be an active effort or is it a passive effort to swing by the fire station on a Saturday or something like that um, I'll ask Secretary Smith again to answer that but uh, good to hear your voice Mike uh, I wasn't sure whether you'd be on this week after reading some of the headlines so <laughs> Uh, but good to have you back. Good, good to be alive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mike, the, there's going to be multiple ways that these will uh, be distributed, that could be distributed, and we'll leave it up to the local um, uh, communities how they want it. You could have a distribution day at a local fire department or rescue squad. You could have them available to rescue, uh, to take on calls in case patients' families need them. Uh, you can have them in a box in a lobby in a town office, if the town office is open, of course. You can make them available by appointment at the town office, or the health officer can deliver them directly to those in needs. We're gonna leave it up to the local communities how best to distribute them. And, and, and remember, we're asking the local communities if they want them. We're not gonna force them on each other, but we've had a, over, my understanding as of this morning, we've had an overwhelming response from the communities in terms of wanting these masks. No, I understand, I just was trying to figure out that you know you, you go where the problem is and and the people that are walking into uh, public places convenience stores whatever that don't wear masks probably aren't going to go to the fire station to get one they just you know you got to go to where the problem is kind of thing that's why i was wondering this. yeah if this is just going to be passive or real aggressive not aggressive but at least a outward effort just remember as of just remember as of tomorrow um, to walk into that grocery store they're going to have to have a mask on yeah and i and i was in south Bronga the other day and the store clerk told me 20 percent uh, are wearing masks in the store and they have a an ordinance there so uh we'll have to see but governor uh just wondering we had different reports in recent months about how some of your decisions are made by this administration and everything like that and and there's a lot of complex issues i understand and uh my understanding is that there's like topic focused advisory committees doing considerable studies about what should or should not be done and uh some of their advice gets ignored or overruled when it apparently gets pushed up to what I guess is the restart Vermont committee, and then they get reversed or change it, and uh, and then at some point it apparently goes to Dr. Levine, who can veto it or rewrite the findings. At some point, it may or may not get to you. Can you just sort of give the public an idea of, of how the system works with these advisory committees, the restart committee, Dr. Levine, and and how these things change when the advisory committees are in place to give you their best thoughts. Yeah, you're, uh, you're actually describing it much more complex than I had perceived it. Um, we, uh, you know, I rely on uh, a lot of advice from a lot of different entities. Um, 
uh, but when it comes down to the very end, when it gets funneled uh, to me, um, I have you know a very short list of people that, who I'm listening to, and, and that involves Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso, uh, many of my cabinet members, uh, and, and trying to do what I think is right as well. I mean, because I, I watch uh, the data, I watch uh, um, what's happening around the country and the region as well. So when I keep track of the numbers in, let's say, New York, as I do on a daily basis, or Massachusetts, or even you know, Florida, what I'm seeing in Florida and California and so forth, um, it has an effect on me, and, and I'm just trying to, again, stay one step ahead. So I take uh, everyone's advice. It doesn't mean that I do everything uh, that, uh, that my, uh, my folks uh, ask to do or, or at least consider, uh, but I will say one thing. If, uh, if Dr. Levine uh, or Dr. Kelso feel strongly about something, I listen, and, uh, and I do it. And so uh, that... Um, that is something, again, that uh, I, uh, I rely on them heavily uh, for some of the decisions I have to make. But, but I don't believe, I, I'll let Dr. Levine answer for himself, but there hasn't been anything that uh, he's asked me to do that I haven't done. Uh, and, uh, and I think that we, as, a, as an administration, uh, have done a pretty good job listening to one another, uh, having some of the debates we have. But uh, in the end, I think we we come out together on and 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 are are very, um, I guess, uh, uh, single-minded on, on the issue when we when we do make a decision in the end. Dr. Levine, I'd, I'd say Dr. Levine, Secretary Smith, Mr. Pichek, feel free to answer. But Dr. Levine, just just real quickly uh, to piggyback on, um, it's a team effort. In the end, the governor is still the governor, and he uh, is at the top of the team. But everything that we talk about is a team effort. It's not put into a specific uh, basket. And though public health weighs in on everything, uh, we have far less power, if you will, than you were implying in your question, Mike, uh, uh, in terms of the ultimate veto power. Uh, there are times that then we are in a public health crisis and an epidemic, so obviously the public health point of view has to weigh in on all the issues that are occurring uh, to make sure that we keep Vermonters safe and we don't put anybody at excess risk by a decision that's made. Uh, but these things are not snap judgments. These are things that really, at times, you know, we go through the entire health department and help us inform the governor as well. It's not just one or two people uh, with a great idea. And then the team takes that and we mold it and work together to make the right decision about the specific topic. And it's worked very well. Um, but I would say that in spite of uh, all these focus groups you mentioned and what have you, I, I, I don't see us actually working at odds with any of them. Uh, because they're providing an input that's really important to the decision making, just like the public health input is important to the decision making. So it really isn't a snap judgment on anything that's been done. Um, it's really deliberated quite a bit. But I get the impression that uh, from the people I've talked to that they have made decisions based on a lot of information and then it gets vetoed or rewritten or reversed or whatever, conceivably at your level. And I'm just wondering, do you have any, do you go back to that committee and talk to them one-on-one -on -one and why you vetoed it or why you reversed it? Um, Mike, our, our meetings, um, when we have our, our meetings together, uh, are there's open dialogue amongst all of us uh, in presenting different facts, uh, different considerations, um, but nothing is really done in a vacuum. Uh, we, we make the decisions together. And, and I think everyone, as far as I'm, I know, uh, everyone uh, is on board. Now, there may, be, uh, you know, there may be some who feel strongly about opening up the, the economy maybe faster uh, than I'm comfortable with. Uh, and uh, and that's been the case at, at times. And so 
but we have those discussions and those deliberations. Uh, and in the end, I um, try and do what I think, again, is right and something that I can live with and something I can stand in front of you at a press conference two to three times a week and feel okay about the decisions I make uh, and confident that we're doing it for the right reasons. So I'm, I'm the one in the end that has to, to stand before you uh, and make the case for whatever we've done or haven't done. Sure. Okay, great. I think we need to move okay. on. Okay, thank you very much. Oh. Yeah. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, for these uh, Mississippi inmates, it seems like the Department of Corrections was taking a proactive approach in testing all of its facilities, all the inmates and staff in Vermont. But for these inmates, it seems like they were almost an afterthought where it takes seven of them to test positive and now they're going to start being tested. Why weren't they already part of the testing procedure the department was doing? Hi, Eric. I'm Mike Smith. Let me just uh, answer that. Uh, um, a couple of things. I, I want to go back and explain what's, uh, what's going on now and then explain, get to your question um, because it, they all tie together. All Vermont prisoners um, currently in Mississippi will be tested. They started last night. We hope to have it finished today. Um, that testing will, um, the, the tests are going to be sent to the state lab in Jackson, Mississippi. I want to thank the state of uh, Mississippi uh, for allowing us to use their state lab. Uh, given the prevalence of the virus in the state, we're, uh, we're now going to establish a program that periodically tests inmates in, a, in Mississippi in a way that's similar to how we test in our other facilities here in Vermont. But given uh, that testing capacity uh, doesn't seem to be as robust in uh, Mississippi as perhaps elsewhere in the U.S. and certainly not here in Vermont. As you know, Vermont is uh, one of four states that uh, a Harvard study said that we were in the position to suppress, through our testing, suppress the virus. and. Uh, through a Marshall Project uh, uh, investigation, we, they found that uh, Vermont was tests the most of any state, and the, the, the data was limited in terms of what was going on in other states, but nonetheless, the data that they had, it showed that Vermont tested the most of any state in the country in terms of its correction policy. Um, we have to figure out the logistics for um, testing that, but we're going to be testing on a periodic basis down there. Now, you asked the question, why would, didn't we do it earlier? Uh, the contractor that we have, the Mississippi uh, contractor that we have uh, for the corrections, had a testing uh, protocol that symptomatic um, uh, 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 patients would be tested and, and that does produce good results in a sort of a low prevalence environment, but that is no longer the case in Mississippi. And we have learned in Vermont, when you have multiple cases, as we saw the other day, when you have multiple cases, more aggressive testing is needed. And that's what Corrections is working to put in place right now. As you remember, we used to do symptomatic testing here until our, until our cap, uh, testing capabilities were robust enough. And secondly, when we had multiple outbreaks, we aggressively tested our facilities here. And as, as you recall, Eric, we test one facility just about every week. Um, and, and that's staff and, um, and inmates that we do here in Vermont. We're gonna impose a similar program in, uh, in Mississippi, given the fact that their uh, prevalence of the virus has increased greatly. Okay. So these uh, six that came in, were, were was the van just six inmates? Was that all the six inmates in that van tested positive? Mm -hmm. Or were there more people in the van? It was actually a bus type of uh, a vehicle 
there were six inmates and uh, my understanding two drivers that were in there they didn't it drove 30 hours straight through there were bathroom facilities in there um, the contact tracing has alerted the transportation company of the positive test so um, obviously those are not Vermont residents but we have contacted uh, the state of Mississippi as well about uh, this incident. And one last question. Uh, why were these inmates brought back? Was there any specific reason? They're usually brought back to get ready for release. I don't have, the, sp I don't have the specifics on this, but they're usually brought back uh, to get ready for release. Okay, uh, moving on. Greg, to the county courier. Uh, so just a quick follow up, there were no guards on that, just two bus drivers? Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the specifics and there were, yeah, I, I'm sure that there were, there were guards and drivers. Okay. Um, I have a follow up for uh, Secretary French and then another one for uh, a follow up for Secretary Smith. Uh, Secretary French, I understand that many schools, in, at least in this area, are going to be requiring students to stay within the classroom the entire day. Food's going to be delivered to the classroom, uh, and then teachers are going to rotate from, from room to room as needed. Um, is that guidance that's coming down from the state, or is that individual schools that are making those decisions? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, that's uh, an example of an individual school uh, making a decision. I will say uh, that model is out there. Uh, I think also uh, not only in the United States, but in Europe as well. Uh, so it is one that I think uh, we will be still consider. Okay. Uh, Secretary Smith, uh, follow up on that for you. Uh, inmates in uh, Vermont prisons are picky contained in their cells or are they able to make all throughout the day? Greg, could you repeat the question? I just didn't hear it. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if inmates within Vermont's prisons are contained in their cells all day or are they allowed to kind of mingle within their pods or within their small communities that they're in? Yeah, I don't believe we're in, and I'll double check on this um, with the uh, Commissioner of Corrections. I don't believe we're in lockdown um, in uh, in our in most of our facilities. Uh, the, the reason I'm hesitating a little bit, I'm not sure with Marble Valley with the six positives down there, Greg. But I'll get back to you on that. Okay, and then uh, follow up for Governor Scott on that, and then a, a question. And I'll be done. Uh, Governor Scott, you know, some people that I've talked to, you know, feel like it's a little bit backwards to have our school children being uh, contained to a classroom all day long when, you know, in, even inmates in our, our state prisons can, can mingle a bit. Um, what's your take on that? And then, uh, unrelated, but uh, my question for today is. Uh, with a NASCAR race uh, and no travel restrictions in Merrimack County, is there a concern that that event can, could significantly spread uh, COVID back to Vermont? And what's the state doing to mitigate uh, as far as that particular instance goes? Um, well, the first question, I'm, I'm not sure about the, the policies with uh, keeping kids in classrooms. Uh, I think that uh, once we gain more confidence in what we're doing, uh, then I would say that there would be more flexibility. Uh, we want to make sure the kids uh, get outside, for instance, and get some fresh air and so forth and so on. So I think uh, you'll see uh, as, uh, as this moves forward uh, that, uh, that we'll be able to, uh, to, to have in-person instruction and create more flexibility. But it might take some time for some, for some districts to do that and some schools to do that. Um, in terms of the, uh, the NASCAR race, I know it's a very limited uh, number of uh, spectators allowed into the, the race in New Hampshire. Um, I believe uh, that they are doing temperature checks and masks are required. So if everyone does what they're supposed to do uh, and socially or physically distance themselves, 
uh, they should be fine um, by the time they get through. But we'll handle it just like we have everything else. Uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be testing and tracing and, and watching for outbreaks and contain them as we can. But I would say this for any Vermonters who are going to the NASCAR race uh, in New Hampshire this weekend, uh, make sure you wear a mask. Make sure you wash your hands a lot. Uh, stay uh, distance uh, from others. Uh, don't get in close contact with others. And uh, if you don't feel well, stay home. It's not worth it. You can watch the race on the uh, on TV. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. So, Have a great weekend. Steve Merrill. Um, hello, can you hear me? Ken. Uh, great, thank you. Um, quick one for the uh, doctor and uh, then maybe a couple for the governor. Um, Dr. Levine, um, recently Dr. Fauci is suggesting or he wants people to wear goggles. Uh, could they be, uh, could that kind of a mandate be coming next? Uh, he didn't refer to it in that way, though, did he? Um, he was just recommending. I remember seeing the clip, and he was talking about uh, mucosa being a, a vector, right. uh, a prime vector, and and that you know that, that goggles, uh, you know, are very important. And uh, it just sounded to me like he was headed in that direction. Yeah. So uh, I don't envision that becoming a, a mandate anywhere. Um, the, the, the reason we all talk about washing your hands so much is because people have done studies of uh, just looking around a room, how often people touch their face. It's they just an incredible again. number of times. So again, the areas we're concerned about are the mouth, the nose, and the eyes uh, as a portal of entry. So if one's washing their hands very reliably, hopefully you reduce the likelihood you'll, uh, when you do touch your eyes, you'll bring virus to your eyes. But the other part is, um, you know, when we have people in full PPE, um, we are definitely covering their eyes because they are at markedly increased risk due to the activities they're doing. If a member of the public um, is wearing their mask and staying appropriately distanced and washing their hands, they shouldn't need to have a mandate to wear goggles on top of that. Okay. Or maybe we maybe we could have them wear rubber bands as, on their fingers as a reminder not to touch their face so often. <laughs> you could be uh, you could be an entrepreneur, Steve. Steve, you say you want to be governor. Can we get to that? Move along. Yes, uh, Governor. Um, have have you or your staff? I uh, had a chance to read uh, any of the uh, the compliance files or the reporting files. Uh, what files are you referring to? The ones where the, the ones where people uh, get on the internet and report, you know, non-compliance to the authorities. Oh, I, or, I'm, uh, I'm sure I'm sure some in the administration have, uh, particularly in public safety or um, agency of commerce and community development, but I have not personally. Uh, gone and looked at them, no. Uh, well, I wanted to thank Mike Sherling and his staff for, you know, for uh, sending those out to me. And uh, uh, some of them, I'd say about you know, a good 10% are, are, are really humorous uh, and, and different. But uh, if you get a chance, uh, they're, they're really worth looking into. Uh, and uh, I, I had a question about the algae blooms, too. Um, it, we're, we've already seen a couple of beach closures this year, and uh, and we had a report from um, the auditor, uh, the state auditor, about um, the lack of, uh, of well, the, the money not uh, go, you know not remedying any of the uh, of the existing structural problems. Um, it is uh, is this something that the administration is looking into? Well, this is a long-term project. I mean, it's not something that was, uh, I don't think any of us, at least in this administration, uh, had ever proclaimed that we would be able to uh, turn this around overnight. In fact, uh, that's why 
it's over a 20 to 30 year period uh, and we're taking steps every uh, uh, every uh, year uh, to make make gains in this and uh, and some of this would require you know phosphorus reduction some of it with agriculture some of it with the waste treatment plants um, doing everything we can uh, to slow the amount of phosphorus going into some of these uh, lakes and streams so um, this uh, again we never uh, had had promised this would be overnight. In fact, uh, we had uh, advocated that this is going to take some time uh, to undo the damage that's been done over the years. But I think we're making gains. I think we're uh, we're we're put we put a lot of money uh, into place, uh, found revenue uh, to put towards this effort. Uh, but I think I think we're making gains. It just it, it just makes me scratch my head that we once had thirty thousand farms. They were all spreading dry manure right up to streams, and there never seemed to be these problems. Oh, well, I, I would, then, I would, know, I would beg to, <laughs> to differ on that, Steve. I think what we're seeing now is a result of that. I mean, we're seeing, you know, some of the some of the sedimentation uh, that is in uh, some of the the beds of the lakes and streams is part of the problem. It's still there, uh, so that's uh, I, I, I would let. Uh, Julie Moore, uh, Secretary Moore, uh, uh, debate further on this, but uh, maybe for another time. But I, I would say the science shows that some of it uh, is is in it's the sediment. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, Thanks, great. Uh, thank you very much. Mike Dialowski. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, I have a COVID treatment question. Uh, thanks, Mike Lost with True North Reports. Uh, top Yale health professor Harvey Rich just said in Newsweek that we need to use hydroxychloroquine. Seven studies since June have demonstrated that it works on COVID. Dr. C Stephen Smith of the Center of Infectious Diseases in New Jersey has successfully treated hundreds of patients using the drug. Texas U.S. Representative Louis Gomer who has the virus said his doctor is treating him with hydroxychloroquine. In light of these facts, why isn't Vermont looking more into the use of this drug to treat patients? Well, as you know, uh, I'm going to let uh, Dr. Levine answer this, but uh, as you know, Mike, uh, we've had a fairly low prevalence of late of, uh, of having to treat many COVID patients. You know, we've only had this week, you know, two or three, and sometimes we have an outbreak. Uh, and uh, we have two uh, in our hospitals right now being treated for, for COVID, uh, one in ICU. Um, so we don't have a high prevalence uh, in this state at this point in time, but uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer the technical aspect. Thank you. Yeah, I think you know, you've pointed out, uh, like most things, there's controversy. And the field is changing rapidly and the science is evolving rapidly. However, if one looks at the science in the published studies, you can pick things out that will be on either side of the fence with hydroxychloroquine. However, most authorities are coming down that the weight of evidence has not yet shown it to be an effective treatment that is as safe as perhaps other treatments, especially in light of its cardiac effects. But lest you think we're not paying attention to treatment, we get regular shipments of remdesivir to the state, and uh, that's available to all of our hospitalized patients in the state. Um, and it has been shown to be efficacious in shortening the duration of illness. Dexamethasone is widely available and is also very useful and may actually have a survival benefit um, when treating very ill patients with COVID. And there's a uh, anti-inflammatory drug, because again, most of the drugs we use don't necessarily kill the virus as much as they are going to work on the body's immune response, which is the so-called cytokine storm, all of the inflammatory mediators. And baricitinib is a drug that's being actively used, um, certainly at the University of Vermont Medical Center, but also, there's a protocol that's available to those around the state uh, to try to interfere with that inflammatory cascade and improve the outcomes of patients who are ill in the hospital with COVID. 
Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, if I may follow up, if there is more uh, studies that continue to come out that show that some people are benefiting from the drug, would the administration uh, look further into it? Oh, would, would the administration, what? Look further into the drug if, if more people come out on the other side saying that there is benefit from hydroxychloroquine. Yes, and actually we work regularly, you know, it's not just the government, uh, we work regularly with the scientific community within the state. Um, people who actually prescribe these drugs all the time, and many who are involved in research engagements that uh, are testing these drugs in other diseases. So clearly uh, we wouldn't put our heads in the sand, uh, but at the moment we don't think that the weight of evidence is in that place where we can do that. Uh, just real quick, if somebody wanted to, if somebody has COVID and they want to use this drug or try this drug or ask a doctor about it, would they be given uh, support or access to it? I, or if their doctor allowed for it? Yeah, actually, you know, any doctor has access to this drug if they want it, if they wanted to order it. Um, so they, they could presumably uh, prescribe it to a patient. I think a okay. lot of what you hear in the news is people trying to use it for prevention of serious illness, and that's where it stands on even shakier ground. Uh, but clearly the drug is not a restricted drug. It's only concerning because so many of the traditional uses of the drug uh, need to still occur, and we don't want the drug to be out of circulation or a supply demand thing that is interfering with its use and the diseases that people are taking it for uh, where it's been shown to be helpful. Thanks, Mike. I think we need to keep moving. Guy Page. <clears throat> Governor, yesterday an old friend who's raising a 15-year-old son of her drug-addicted daughter said their school district won't be offering driver's ed. <clears throat> The uh, DMV website says all 16 and 17 year olds must pass the state approved driver's ed course. Could and would you, without legislative action, approve certain guardians to conduct driver education? Yeah, Guy, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're considering some of that. We don't know who uh, will offer and who will, won't. Um, it's, a, it's a topic of conversation. Uh, obviously, I have an interest in uh, making sure that people are able to uh, to get their licenses and, and get to get to enjoy the, the freedom of driving. Uh, so um, I have an interest in this personally, uh, but um, but we're we're considering this. We're we're looking into it, uh, and we'll take uh, take steps as necessary uh, to make sure that we fill that need. Okay. What sort of steps? Well, whatever it takes. Uh, again, we don't know the magnitude of the problem at this point. Uh, we've only heard um, that uh, anecdotally, in some respects, uh, that, that uh, some districts won't be offering a driver a driver's ed, uh, but uh, but we'll take steps appropriately. Uh, Secretary French, is there anything uh, you can add to this? Uh, a bit, Governor. Um, yeah, there was an opportunity, I think, with the state board uh, to consider a waiver of some regulations, and that conversation started in April. Uh, I think, once again, to your point, largely based on some anecdotal concerns, um, and we thought somewhat, to a certain extent, the issue would be resolving itself as uh, programs started to uh, start back up the summer with the reopening of the larger economy. Uh, so it's something certainly we're going to have to assess um, and something we can take a look at in the fall in terms of regulatory uh, guidance. Okay. I turn French. I want to thank your staff for sending me over the updated homeschooling application last week. That was uh, apparently it's, it's up 75 percent over last year as of July 15th. Can you give me the, the latest through the end of July numbers on on homeschooling applications? Uh, we can certainly send that data over to you. Uh, last time I checked, I think uh, around Monday, it's still holding at about a 75 percent increase over last year. Okay. Thank you welcome. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Thank you. I'd like to know how much of the grant funding that the legislature has allocated for COVID business relief has been either awarded or is in the application process. We're hearing from local businesses 
who were ineligible either because their losses were under 50 percent or they had not owned their business for an entire year and could not show that year-over-year -year loss in any given month. Has the administration been in contact with the legislature about revising the criteria for receiving grants? Yeah, I, I don't know if Commissioner Goldstein is on the line. She's not. Um, Commissioner, or Secretary Curley um, might be able to answer part of that. But Lisa, um, we are, uh, again, watching. Uh, the program is still active. Uh, we're still accepting applications. Uh, but we, uh, we still have money available at this point. When uh, they're at the appropriate time, uh, we will be asking the legislature for more flexibility or coming up within the parameters of what they've given us uh, for flexibility uh, to make sure that we get the money out the door because we're we're seeing some of the same things uh, whether it's sole proprietors and so forth or uh, those who haven't uh, gotten to the limit of a of a 50 percent um, loss and uh, and other uh, things uh, other issues that are problematic in uh, obtaining the money so uh, we'll be we'll be working at this, uh, making sure that we're helping those businesses uh, survive, uh, so they can thrive in the future. Uh, Secretary Curley, anything you can offer at this point? If not, uh, sure. we, we um, can we can get yeah. more information to Lisa uh, in the near future. Yeah. yeah, I can offer a little bit. Um, we can. Brett, I'm glad you brought this up because it does give us a, an important moment to share that there is still money left. This uh, first. Around uh, uh, nearly 80 million, I would say. There's more in the queue to be to be sent out. Have been sent yet? And um, you know, we know that there are businesses out there who would qualify that haven't applied, and there may be a variety of reasons that they haven't. But it may be because folks don't know about it as broadly as we hope. So we definitely want to get the word out there and have people go to the ACCD website, and um, it'll walk you through some questions and an opportunity to apply. The application process is pretty quick. You do have to have a little bit of financial statements ready to go, but um, I've heard it, it takes about 10 minutes if you have things ready when you when you start the process. So, um, you know, again, get the word out for us, and uh, we're still processing applications. There's a very intense review process that happens at the agency. So. Um, as I mentioned, we do have money, but, but we have some in the queue as well, so people shouldn't delay. They should get their application in. Thank you for that. I think the issue is for many of our local businesses is they may have had a 44% reduction in revenue for any given month, or they may have had a 49 or a 32. And uh, yeah. I think that cliff is what people are opening up against. Sure. And, you know, we are, as the governor said, we're in contact with the legislators. Um, making a change like that would require legislative action. So if when they come back in August, that's something that they want to want to look at, you know, we'll have a conversation with them. But um, we are keeping track of, of the businesses that are, that are arguably, you know, not qualifying for something that's really close. And, um, you know, we'll have those conversations as we go. We, we continue to have them um, right along. So we know there are a lot of people in need, and we, we really want to do everything we can do to help keep them, as, as the governor said, to survive now and to thrive going forward. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner Curley. Courtney Aslan, Local 22, Local 44. Hi. Um, my questions were actually already asked, so I don't have any at this time. So thank you, and happy Friday. Thanks, thank you, Courtney. Courtney. Sean Cunningham, the Chester Telegraph. Uh, hi, um, this is for Dr. Levine. Um, and and it, you may not have seen this yet, I just wondered if you could comment on a research letter that was published yesterday uh, in JAMA Pediatrics about um, a larger amount of um, SARS virus in the respiratory tract of young children than has been, uh, I guess, has been reported before. Yeah, thanks for the question. I was kind of anticipating someone would ask about that. Um, that's uh, pretty much, a, like you said, a research letter. It's more of a laboratory kind of study, but it looked at very young children and found that even when they were asymptomatic, there were young children who had a very large, I'll call it inoculum of virus, uh, when they were tested. 
So not only did they test positive, but it seemed to be a much uh, more potent concentration of virus um, that in theory uh, they could spread to others. Uh, so it's really a study a little bit out of context in terms of uh, does this happen all the time? Is this like a rare event, a common event? Uh, what implications does it have for schools, for adults, etc.? cetera? Um, so it's coming out um, at a time when, of course, the entire nation is getting very anxious about the opening of schools. Uh, but it's not the kind of study that should all of a sudden be looked at and it's like, oh my God, we have to stop in our tracks because of this study. Um, because we don't really know the implications of what this study means. We do know, um, again, that children do have a very low rate of getting ill with the virus, getting seriously ill with the virus, being the vector that transmits the virus uh, throughout a classroom or to the adults in the school. And we still have to go with that information that uh, we have abundant evidence to support. So I want to just put it in context in that way and make everyone realize that um, it's a very early finding. More needs to be uh, sought after. And I would still say, and we've emphasized this up here before, the schoolroom, the classroom, the school itself is really a microcosm of the community it's in. The reason it's a good time to open schools in Vermont is because Vermont has the very low rates that Commissioner Pichak showed us on the slides. And in addition, if we all, as a community, adults and children, are responsible in the ways that we've uh, educated about up here, there'll be less likelihood that there will be adults in the schools who can then potentially transmit the virus to a child who might then harbor a virus at a high concentration like this study showed or not, because we don't really know yet. But again, uh, we should really look at uh, the low prevalence of virus as being a positive sign that um, getting our children back into the schools are, is a good idea. Um, just as a follow-up, do you have cycle threshold numbers in, in aggregate for the various um, for the various age groups that you're testing? Yeah, so the, the study uh, did rely on cycle threshold numbers, just for the public to understand. Cycle threshold is this sort of indicator of um, how much virus is there, if I could express it that way. Uh, so that's not something that we're commonly uh, measuring. Uh, that's much more in a research mode um, and could be used in a specific outbreak, what have you, but it's not something that's uh, a focus of what we're doing or that I don't think most states are doing uh, on a routine basis. Um, so, so you're not collecting those, num those numbers. Are you able to? Uh, we, would, we, we would have to... Uh, integrate new technology to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, hi, Governor. Um, I want to clarify something with uh, Secretary Curley about the money available to the uh, recovery grant. Uh, Secretary, you mentioned there's about $80 million already distributed, right, out of the, I think, 166 total and there's some in the pipeline. And I'm wondering how much is available for people to apply for, how much is left of that, of that money? Wait, okay, you wanna know how much is left for people to apply for? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, I don't have that number, I, I can get that to you, um, but, but applications are coming in every day. So um, there's stuff that's being reviewed that hasn't necessarily been approved yet. So. It's a little bit of challenge, but I can I can get you something pretty close. Uh, I, I think it's, I think that my, my point was that there's still a significant amount of money that people should shy away from, still apply. Yeah, I mean I, I wouldn't say it's significant. I'm I'm definitely I, people should be applying for sure. Okay. If if they you know met that threshold and they have that kind of need, I would absolutely say they should be applying. Yeah, we uh, for, we would like it, Tim. Just to be clear, we want people to apply just so that we understand the need. Uh, even if we 
did run out of money. We want to make sure that we're on top of this uh, so that when we can we go back into the legislature, we can advocate for more if, if more is needed. But it's important for businesses uh, to uh, to seek application. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to get that, that cleared up. Thank you. And for um, Secretary Young, uh, there have been a, a couple of reports, uh, Commissioner Gresham was before the legislature, and, he, and the way it was reported was a fairly rosy picture on the revenue scene, with the caveat that that could have been just um, the, the fallout from 2019. And I'm wondering what your, you know, I look at the rooms and meals tax, which is obviously struggling, and, and uh, the $600 uh, federal uh, unemployment insurance is ending. What, what are the red flags you're, you're uh, looking at for uh, the revenues going forward? Uh, Jim, I think the red flags we um, are looking for is really just generally what impact on the revenues we collect next April for this calendar for tax year 2020 um, are going to look like uh, because those are the revenues right, where we're going to feel the um, you know the biggest hit because of uh, the pandemic and the shutdown of our economy for a period of time. Is there? Can you speak to the the rooms and meals tax? It's sort of relied on for both the general fund and the education fund. Is that is that uh, as big a concern as I kind of look at it as? Yeah, and uh, de definitely the meals and rooms tax um, came in, you know, 27 million below the January forecast, um, or 15 percent uh, in the um, year to date. I believe uh, 20 FY20 um, revenue. So yeah, there is a bit, and that's not uh, a tax that you know we are going to collect later on. That's a tax that's not collectible. So there are some categories of taxes that we're just not going to make up like we, um, we may make up in, in other areas uh, because of the deferred deadline. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Tim, uh, just to elaborate a little bit further, um, we are obviously very concerned about next year's budget. Um, we were uh, pleasantly surprised uh, by seeing some of the numbers coming in from from last year, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, uh, but uh, but it looked like businesses were doing very well, individuals were doing very well, and added to the revenues uh, that we're seeing today. Uh, and I reflect on, uh, you know, uh, obviously, unfortunate we're having this pandemic uh, in general. Uh, but can you imagine uh, the surplus we might have had uh, had we not had to uh, go through this pandemic uh, with the numbers that we're seeing today getting through? Uh, what was a problematic year, with the end being in uh, in the midst of a, a worldwide pandemic, uh, what we what might have been, and uh, and I think that the again we, we can't go backwards, uh, but finishing out the year on uh, fairly solid ground uh, without uh, a, a, a deficit um, is uh, not something every state can say, and uh, again with. With what we've done over the last uh, three or four years, no new taxes or fees, and and uh, over uh, at least uh, the majority of that uh, four years, um, and still uh, had what could have been a record surplus, uh, says a lot about uh, what we need to do in the future. Yeah, I think we're all looking forward to that. Uh, thank you, Governor. Aaron Patanko, BT Digger. Hi. Um, when it comes to the uh, prisoners testing positive and just the general response, um, I wanted to ask, are you generally happy with how Sports Civic has handled this situation and happy with how it is treating the prisoners in their prisons in general? Um, or just let, how do you feel about it? Again, I'll let Secretary Smith answer part of that, but from, from my standpoint, uh, as opposed to what we had uh, experienced with, uh, in I think it was Pennsylvania, uh, they're doing a much better job uh, than was done before. Obviously, we'd like to have all uh, of our offenders back within our state borders, but that's not possible with the physical uh, facilities that we have uh, today. So um, again, I, I think that they've done uh, a good job uh, thus far, um, but, um, but in the future, it would be uh, it would be more advantageous if we had a newer facility here in Vermont where we could bring everyone back. Thank you, sir. 
Aaron, I think the uh, governor said it all. Obviously, a pandemic has stretched all of us, and we would like the fact that nobody would test positive. That's not probable uh, as we move forward. The, the question is, can we put the mechanisms in place to minimize the number of people that test positive? And I think we have here in Vermont, we need to uh, do better in uh, Mississippi now that they have a high prevalence of the virus in that state. Uh, so um, let's, let's put an incomplete in terms of uh, virus response on that. But in terms of overall, um, it's night and day from what I, what I used to read about uh, uh, our out-of-state correctional facilities. I just wanted to add one thing just because we've had a number of questions and I'm sure it wasn't the intention of the questions about the prisoners but that this event that we've documented for you today is a failure of a system and I want us to look at it the other way if I could uh, the success of a system uh, because not only do we have a great system for any new uh, inmate coming into our prison system, but all of the protocols that we've developed are really to make sure that we catch things like we caught this time around with six inmates that are testing positive that could potentially infect an entire facility, affect the staff who then uh, vector it elsewhere through the facility. We have protocols in place that really guard against that happening. And not only the testing part of the protocols, but the quarantine part of the protocols. Um, just because we know that that's the biggest inherent danger to any facility that's self-enclosed like a prison, is that uh, you would bring a virus in uh, unknowingly, and in the asymptomatic period, it would spread to others. So I just wanted to reframe our perspective a little on that. Thank you. Dan Wallace-Allen, BT Bigger. Um, yeah, and this is just a, a, a really a quick question um, for the governor. I'm wondering, um, with cases with cases actually still rising in the Northeast, why why change anything right now? Like the last turn of the spigot, is there some urgency or some reason, or were retailers asking you, or yeah, what's the reason yeah, behind it? Yeah, we were actually um, working on this for the last four to five weeks. Uh, the retailers were asking. Uh, we, as you remember, uh, we had increased uh, to 50 percent many other sectors, um, and uh, this was the next one in line. And I'd made uh, the, uh, I guess, uh, promise in some respects uh, that we take a look at our mass policy before we turned up uh, the, the spigot, opened up uh, the retail market to 50 percent. And, um, and when we decided to move forward, I decided to move forward with the mass mandate. It made perfect sense to open up uh, the retail market as well. Uh, Dr. Levine, um, and again, I'll let him speak for himself, uh, but was quite comfortable even before the mass mandate to open up uh, the retail market to 50% because that's not where we're seeing uh, all of the transmission uh, of this virus uh, we're seeing in other settings. So. Uh, this was fairly low risk, uh, but it, this will help uh, that sector uh, and help uh, help those, uh, you know, utilizing the services in those sectors as well. Anything else, Dr. Levine, you'd like to offer? Hi. It, it just goes back to the uh, the rules of contact that, that we've, I've described before. You know, in the retail setting, there's not a prolonged contact with anyone usually. There's not a prolonged time that you're actually in that facility, uh, unlike a gym or a restaurant or what have you, where you may be sitting and engaged with other people for a period of time. And there's, there's just not a lot of one-on-one -on -one close contact. And where there is, it's usually at a cash register where they have plexiglass and uh, everyone's masked and uh, the likelihood of having any disease is very low. And many of our retail facilities obviously are sort of mom and pop, but others are very large. And um, there's plenty of room for people usually to move around and uh, breathe fresh air in the, in the, in the building and, and not 
really put themselves at high risk? Thanks for the question. Uh, all right. Um, it's just that, you know, the, usually you do this when cases are, are the caseload is dropping. And um, with it rising, it just, um, it just seems anomalous. Well, I want, I want to be clear, though. I mean, what we're seeing here in Vermont, uh, the caseload is not increasing. You might see that outside, outside the state, but uh, for those uh, patrons of uh, Vermonters that utilize uh, these retail operations, we're not seeing an increase here in Vermont. So that's, that's who typically u utilizes uh, the retail functions here in Vermont, and uh, we just want to make sure that we're moving forward as much as we can safely, uh, move forward as, as much as we can. All right, thank you. Olivia Lyons, WCAX. Olivia Lyons, star six on mute. Okay, we're gonna move Hello. on. Hi. Oh, go ahead. Hi. Sorry, technical issues. Um, I have a question for Governor Scott and Secretary Frank. The Vermont NEA released a four-phase plan yesterday. It would delay beginning actual elections past the September 8th start date to talk with each student about the pandemic, how it affected them, and assess their well-being. Do you think there is a benefit to this rather than just jumping into teaching and not knowing where each student is academically and emotionally? Um, well, you packed a lot into that, uh, that question. Uh, but I would say um, we've been working at this for quite some time. As I relayed last Friday, I believe, um, we've been working on this plan for seven weeks, uh, put out the guidelines and so forth. Um, extending this uh, for a week or two uh, would give districts, school districts, uh, the ability to test out the systems, to make sure that we're doing this in a safe manner. I, uh, along with our state experts, our health experts, and, and those in the field uh, feel that, uh, that what we're doing uh, is, uh, is safe. Uh, it's something that's, uh, that is, is, is something that's beneficial uh, for our kids, uh, and uh, it's the right thing to do. And as I said last Friday, um, with our low positivity rates, uh, with our low number of cases, uh, with our, we're the only state uh, that has been identified who have, has suppressed the virus. If we can't do it, then no other state can. Um, so I believe we're in a better position than any other state uh, to put this into place. And I, I, to be honest, I haven't seen the letter uh, from the NEA, but I believe what we're putting into place, starting again, extending that date to September 8th, getting everyone uh, ready and accustomed to whatever they're going to do, allowing for a lot of flexibility uh, and to build that trust, that confidence in the system, uh, I think it'll prove that we can have more in-person instruction. instruction. Uh, but, uh, but it doesn't preclude a uh, school, school district from, from doing whatever, I mean, taking more time, having more uh, of a hybrid situation where you're doing more online instruction. But as well, if a school or district uh, feels they can move forward with a five day a week instruction, in person instruction, they can do so. So uh, I think we've allowed for a lot of flexibility. Uh, I believe it can work. Our state experts, our healthcare experts, our, our epidemiologists, everyone thinks we can do this. And it really does, as you heard last Friday. Think about the kids, what their needs are. And, uh, and this will. Uh, I think benefit them tremendously. Uh, Secretary French. Yes, uh, Governor, I would just ask, um, you know, to Olivia, to your question about uh, assessing uh, student learning, I think that also underscores the importance of reopening schools. And uh, particularly, when we, we couple that educational dean with uh, the epidemiological uh, evidence or, or conclusions that particularly for those students in grades K through five, uh, there are compelling scientific reasons why we can reopen. There's compelling educational reasons uh, why we can reopen. And I think that uh, as a state, we're just going to have to, uh, you know, reconcile these issues to a certain extent. But I think the bottom line is from, I will say, a moral perspective is we have an obligation uh, to address the needs of these students. And they're not necessarily, uh, 
you know, doing well uh, under uh, what happened in the spring. And uh, we, I feel a sense of urgency to uh, get these systems back online and start addressing them. And that's, from the sounds of it, that's what the Vermont NEA wants. They want to assess these needs and make sure that kids are getting the help that they need because this pandemic's obviously been very tough on them. So they think by extending it, they would be able to really figure out what each kid needs going into the school year. Would you suggest that in the few weeks leading up to September 8th, they start reaching out to families then? No, I think, you know, firstly, it's uh, the, the public health conditions, uh, as I've been an observer and a consumer of that information, that, you know, as, as the governor said, the public health conditions don't warrant uh, more delay. I mean, if anything, they would point to a more aggressive reopening. Uh, the conditions of Vermont arrived at uh, really support uh, going back to school. Um, but I think, secondly, it's, uh, it would, the emphasis needs to be on reopening school and getting those routines reestablished. I think just the fact of getting schools open and getting those routines going is part of the antidote, if you will, to dealing with some of the social emotional uh, stress that this emergency has created. So I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, thinking that, you know, opening schools to start doing academic assessment is, is the primary focus, uh, but it certainly is important that we begin that work. But I think primarily right now, uh, our focus is on reopening schools, getting those re routines reestablished, because uh, those routines themselves are just vital to student development and they're vital to our communities. Great, thank you very much. Kevin McCallum, seven days. Can you hear me, Governor? We can. Sorry for the delay there. My question involves the mask mandate. Uh, for the question for you, that is, Governor. Um, why did you say previously to Calvin's question that you leave it up to the prerogative of business owners about whether uh, people um, should wear masks? And what's the point of a mask mandate if, um, if people, if business owners don't have to follow it or have their customers follow yeah. it? Yeah, no, it's required, uh, Kevin. Um, it's just that I don't want them to be in the middle of a controversy. Uh, and so we're trying to downplay that, do everything we can. We would advocate uh, that the, uh, the business uh, follow the rules um, and, uh, and trying to instruct uh, those patrons coming into their stores and to do the right thing, offer uh, curbside service, uh, do everything they can uh, to allow for that. Uh, but uh, but the, the mandate is, is, is like law. I mean, it's, it's there. And, uh, and it's mandatory that you wear a uh, face covering when entering a public entity uh, into a business. Uh, but I just wanted to downplay uh, the fact uh, that we don't want them to be in the middle of a controversy and put some of the store clerks, maybe some of the young store clerks, right in the middle of something uh, that could be um, harmful uh, to, to others. So uh, again, um, we want everyone to do the right thing. I believe they will. I think there'll be uh, more compliance. But I do, uh, as I said previously, I think education uh, is, uh, is the key to compliance and we'll continue with a mass campaign in order to, uh, to seek that compliance. Okay, so it's mandatory. It's just that the prerogative, it's up to the prerogative of the business owner about whether they want to enforce that, it in their store. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. All right. Uh, my next question is about prisons. Uh, Governor, you mentioned uh, that we'd love to bring back all the prisoners from out of state, um, uh, but we don't have the facilities to do so. But um, didn't we just outline some numbers that indicated that uh, we, we were up at 1,600 and we've since dropped to 1,300? And doesn't that effectively mean that we do have the capacity to bring back all out of state prisoners um, at this very moment? Yeah, if you looked at the if you look at the numbers uh, simplistically, uh, the gross numbers and the net numbers would, would, would say, yes, we have enough room, enough bed space uh, in order to put uh, them back and uh, bring them back to Vermont. Uh, but unfortunately, as you are aware, we have this pandemic going. Uh, we need isolation areas uh, for those uh, who might uh, be um, 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 affected uh, by the coronavirus. So we have to leave some space within each facility 
uh, to accommodate that if it does uh, transpire. Secretary Smith, anything else I should have? Uh, is that, is that make sense, Kevin? It does, but it does raise the question about, well, when the pandemic passes and we get back to normal, um, is the capacity going to be there in the system yeah. then yeah, to quite, bring people back? Yeah, quite possibly, uh, Kevin, it could. Um, well, I would advocate that we need a modernization of the facilities themselves. I think you, you may have uh, been uh, through some of them. Um, but we, at the same time, we don't have a lot of control uh, over the judiciary, a separate branch of government. Uh, and when they send us uh, offenders, uh, people who have to do time, uh, we have to have a space for them. So I would say as we work our way out of the pandemic, we may see, and I think we've already started to see, a bit of a rise in the number of, uh, of offenders uh, prisoners coming into the facility. So I don't think we're at our low point now. I think we were at a low point maybe a month or two ago, uh, but it's, it's slowly been rising as the, the courts open back up, uh, more arrests made and so forth, and things get back to, unfortunately, a normal. Um, so we may not have that space, but it's something, you know, it's a great question. It's something that I've, I've been asking myself of, uh, of corrections and uh, Secretary Smith. Uh, to keep an eye on that because, uh, again, from a simplistic view, when you look at the, the numbers, it, it would appear that we have the space, uh, but we may not by the time the pandemic uh, um, is over. But we'll, we'll cross that bridge, and again, we'll continue to advocate uh, for a modernization of the facilities that we have here in Vermont um, so that we don't have to uh, uh, send prisoners out of state. Got it. Now, the last question is just for Dr. Levine about um, about the abundant evidence he cited. How can there be abundant evidence that children in classroom settings do not spread the disease when children haven't been in classroom settings since the beginning of the pandemic? Thanks for holding me firm on this one. Um, so the abundant evidence is not in the United States predominantly. It's in Europe, Australia, uh, other parts of the world. Um, and so it's more abundant than the U.S. actually. There's a, a large number of countries that have been successful and a very, very small number, at least in the published literature, where they have not been successful. Yeah. And, and you, have you read these studies closely enough to have confidence that the way that they were conducted and the circumstances under which those the conditions uh, existed in those countries and in those schools that, that, that we can replicate that success here? I mean, yes. European countries school very differently than the United States in many ways. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so what do you think? I've read them. Uh, we also had as guests um, two weeks ago, um, Dr. Raska was a guest, and he and Dr. Lee, who are pediatric infectious disease specialists at the uh, University of Vermont Medical Center uh, have written extensively on the topic and had just published an editorial, I believe, in the journal Pediatrics from their review of that literature. Uh, so it's not just been uh, one person vetting this, it's been vetted by a, a large number um, and by the entire, if I could expand it, by the entire field of pediatrics because the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, has been very vocal in uh, using this literature to support their concern that kids are being harmed more by being out of school than the benefit that they would reap by getting back into the school environment. So we're very comfortable with this literature and as we uh, progress along, we will develop the U.S. literature as a country and we will see where there have been successes and where there unfortunately might be failures uh, to be able to guide us better. We lost Kevin's connection. Moving on, I think Dana, I it. Dana Gray, Caledonia Record. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, taking all these calls and, and seeing it through to the end. Um, I, I, I'm going to uh, talk about the executive uh, order reporting tool that was referenced earlier by Steve Merrill, and perhaps this is a question for Commissioner Shirley. Uh, the question uh, regarding that tool is, is it working uh, the way that you envisioned that it should? And what percentage 
of the reports that are made uh, are you actually uh, having uh, people follow up on and investigate? Mr. Shirley. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thanks for the question. I, I don't have offhand the percentage that are being followed up for investigation. I know that the numbers that have made it all the way to the Attorney General's office number and the dozen or less across 1,500 or more uh, reports. Uh, it's working as well as can be hoped. Uh, again, uh, the posture is one of education and wanting to have a uniform uh, reporting and flow to ensure consistency. So. Um, uh, it's working well, uh, but I think you know, our hope is that uh, at some point we can uh, pivot away from uh, that system to uh, really uh, focusing exclusively on, uh, on education. So uh, that remains to be seen as the, as the weeks progress. Sure. So just as a follow-up, sir, uh, with, the, uh, with the actual mask mandate being implemented, um, which should people uh, see this executive reporting tool as a way um, to to sort of alert you guys to some particularly bad actors with the mask mandate? Uh, they certainly can use the tool um, because mask compliance will be something that really is a point in time, singular location kind of uh, kind of thing. I'm not sure how useful it's going to be. Again. Uh, the current posture and the hope is that uh, uh, Vermonters will take the opportunity to, uh, if they choose, to politely uh, engage folks and, and remind them of the, the need for masks without creating confrontations and without creating controversy or shouting matches. Uh, and being mindful that uh, there are folks that are unable to wear a mask for one reason or another. So that's an opportunity to reinforce those messages uh, and again, not focus on the need to uh, to always report these things, whether it's to the uh, the portal or elsewhere. Um, really, the, the main message is that wearing a mask uh, is good for public health. It's good for the people around you. It's good for those who are at risk that you may or may not know about. Uh, there are those who can't uh, always wear masks, and uh, again, uh, the hope is that uh, we'll see exactly the same kinds of compliance we've seen right along, uh, which have enabled Vermont to have uh, some of the best. Uh, virus numbers uh, possible. Thank you. Uh, if I could just give one more question. This one uh, I'm going to direct to Secretary Smith. So if you could uh, just update um, the efforts uh, that, you're, that are in place to try to reduce the reliance on the motel voucher program for homeless people. Secretary Smith. Thank you uh, for the question. We are moving uh, forward with, uh, with some requirements now with the hotel uh, and motel voucher system. Uh, formal application and interviews for all households now um, need, to be, uh, need to be done uh, and to receive services to ensure that we have the most up-to-date information on each household to support the housing uh, recovery plan implementation. Households um, need to cooperate with their community housing provider uh, for intake assessment. It's formerly called a coordinated assessment and a housing case management services and the development of long-term housing plans. We want to move people into long-term housing plans. And we're also looking at households to contribute a percentage of their income uh, to the cost of housing uh, in this uh, facility. As you, as you know, we waived all of these uh, during the pandemic, and we are starting to impose um, these sort of uh, uh, questions and guidelines as we move forward. So uh, these are questions and procedures that we had prior to the pandemic. We're starting to put them back into place. And the pandemic isn't over, and I, I keep uh, the height of the pandemic. But we're our concentration right now with the um, with the program that we put in place, a um, $23 million program, is to move people to longer-term uh, care, uh, longer-term housing instead of uh, 
the current uh, motel hotel system. As I've said before, and as I just want to reiterate, this is not a permanent solution. It's not sustainable. Um, the cost of it is prohibitive, and we need to move to uh, a more permanent housing as we move forward. So that's the update. Thank you. Uh, and just, just a quick follow-up. Uh, in terms of the Northeast Kingdom, uh, Secretary Smith, do you, are, are there any particular plans that you could share with me, uh, particular partners that you're working with on long-term housing uh, opportunities? Let me do this. Uh, let me uh, let the uh, housing uh, portion of uh, DCF get back to you on it, and we'll we'll be region specific for you. That will that way I won't I won't guess or give you some wrong information. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you, sir. All right, last two, Joseph Gresser, Barton Protocol. Hello. Um, this for uh, Secretary Smith. Hope he hasn't gone too far away. Um, concerning um, the facility in Mississippi, um, obviously uh, the state of Vermont is um, responsible for the well-being of the people who are incarcerated there. Um, what kind of supervision does the state have in place? Is there a person there representing Vermont, or do we only find out about things that might be a problem when something like the present situation uh, arises? Well, let me um, start by saying, obviously, the pandemic has slowed down our travel, um, almost stopped our travel uh, to the facility. Uh, in uh, Mississippi. Obviously, we have meetings, and right now I suspect there's several Zoom meetings going on in terms of coordinating it. Just to give you an update, Joe, uh, all tests have com been completed at the facility down there, and they're being shipped to the labs. I think we had 16 refusals, but we're figuring out how to deal with that. Obviously, uh, we keep uh, communications open with the facility down there during normal times. We're down there quite a bit. Um, these are not normal times. At the same time, um, the Defender General's office keeps in close contact with uh, the prisoners down there just to make sure that they have different um, avenues that they can reach out to as well. So we, we don't abandon them down there. Um, we keep in close contact with the uh, super supervisors and uh, and the facility down there. Uh, just, uh, the uh, Defender General keeps close contact with the prisoners down there. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, except I have one follow-up, cool. which is I understand that with the exception of the 15 refusals, um, you have tested all of the Vermont prisoners at the facility, but uh, were they in Vermont, um, all the prisoners and the staff at the facility would also be tested. Um, do you have any assurance that um, this is going to happen? Well, right now, the, the, the Vermont prisoners are in what I understand is a sort of a separate pod area um, so they don't come in contact. My understanding, and I, you're going to have to really talk to the Department of Corrections on this, but my understanding, as it's been explained to me, they are sort of segregated away from other prisoners. We are in conversations with the, um, with the facility down there to make sure that the workforce is, uh, is tested as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, Liam Elder Connors, VPR. Hi, this is a question about the mask mandate that's going into effect. Um, I know that some of the reason around this was because of the, the eventual influx of college students and potentially fall tourists. Um, when I was, I was reading through the order, I, I noticed that it right now only last until August 15th, and I know it can be extended, but I'm just wondering why 
currently it ends on August 15th rather than um, into September when students and tourism is more likely to be occurring in the state. Yeah, it's just the, the um, vehicle, the executive order only lasts until August 15th. So if you let that lapse without a, a subsequent uh, executive order, you, couldn't, you can't forecast it in the future. Um, so it only is active while the executive order is in place. So it's just it's just a technical, uh, the technical aspect of the executive order. Like I could so I couldn't I couldn't that. say I couldn't say you'd have to have a, a mass mandate for the next uh, uh, six months. Uh, it can only go throughout the period of the executive order itself. Okay, so uh, you would be expect, you're expecting to uh, extend the mask mandate then beyond August 15th, along with the I guess the, the rest of the executive order. Yeah, as I've said before, it, you know it's it's um, it's just a vehicle uh, to be able to open up the economy and uh, put these provisions into place. So I wouldn't anticipate uh, that it would end as of August 15th that there would be another executive order. Okay, um, thank you. All right. Thanks. With that, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, have a safe weekend, and we'll see you on Tuesday.